In this video, I will be making tetraethyl lead. Tetraethyl lead used to be a common additive to gasoline. It serves as an anti-knocking agent, which reduces engine knocking and increases the octane rating of the fuel. It allows for higher pressures and temperatures to be reached inside the engine, without causing the fuel mixture to auto-ignite, which improves vehicle performance and fuel economy. Despite that, tetraethyl lead is a very controversial compound. It pollutes the air and environment with lead compounds, which negatively impacted people's health. The toxicity of tetraethyl lead and the pollution it caused was long denied by the lead and oil industry. The extent of lead pollution was first discovered independently in the late 1940s, but it took until the 1970s for countries to start banning tetraethyl lead as a fuel additive. Tetraethyl lead has a difficult history, but is its synthesis as difficult? Let's find out. So for this synthesis, I will need some lead, so I will be using lead wool. After some testing, I settled on this ghetto setup for the first part of the synthesis. It is a stainless steel crucible wrapped in mineral wool. I put a bit of lead wool in the crucible and melted it with a torch. The melting point of lead is only 328C, so it doesn't really require any specialized equipment. Anyhow, what I want to do here is make a sodium lead alloy in a molar ratio of approximately 4 to 1. So to get there, I first melt about 200 grams of lead wool in the crucible. When all of the lead has been added, I skim the top with a steel spatula to get out most of the lead oxides. When that is done, I can start adding the sodium. So here I have two blocks of sodium that weigh 100 grams together. I cut it up into pieces and piece by piece add it to the molten lead. The reaction is relatively tame and the sodium melts quickly, but it seems that it isn't mixing properly into the lead and forms a layer on top. Since lead is very dense and sodium is very light, this is expected. When I add more sodium, it basically sits on top, partially ignites and covers itself with a layer of oxidation. To fix this issue, I use the spatula to force the sodium into the lead. Initially, the reaction becomes a bit more vigorous, but it quickly dies down as it dissolves into the lead and is no longer in contact with the air. So now that we know how to properly add in the sodium, I can add more in quick succession. After adding a big part of the sodium, some impurity is present as a black mass. So I scoop it up with a spatula and simply remove it from the crucible. After a while, the crucible is full and the sodium content is high enough for the mixture to constantly be on fire. So I remove the wool and pour it all into a stone mortar. There is still some sodium left that I want to dissolve, so I force it into the hot alloy again by mixing it. When that is done, I cover the molten alloy with some mineral wool, so that it stops burning in the air. I leave it to cool down and meanwhile prepare for the next step of the synthesis. So I set up a large 3 neck flask and add in a big stir bar. I then add 150 ml of bromoethane and move the flask to a heating mantle. Now I come back to the cooled down alloy and it's a black mass with some crumbles of yellow and orange oxidation. I lift it with a spatula and the alloy breaks right away. The yellow orange impurity also comes off easily. So I just pick up the pieces by hand and rub off all of the junk. When that is done, I discard all of the remaining junk and continue with the larger pieces. So now I am left with some brittle black metallic pieces of the sodium lead alloy. The total weight of all the pieces turned out to be 120 grams. I cannot determine the exact molar ratio of the lead and sodium, but it can still be used even with lower sodium ratios. It snaps in half easily, but it's still relatively hard. It also reacts strongly with water, and seems to oxidize in the air from metallic to black grey. For the next reaction, I will crush the alloy into smaller pieces by hitting it with a pestle. When the pieces are small enough, I move all of it to the flask with the bromoethane while stirring. After I added all of the alloy, I add 16 mils of pyridine, which will serve as a catalyst. I then attach a condenser and a dropping funnel. Now I start refluxing the mixture and add 100 mils of water to the dropping funnel. I leave the mixture to reflux for 8 hours, and every 1-2 to two hours, I add a little bit of water to the flask. After addition of the water, 
the mixture quickly begins to boil vigorously. I repeat this until it has been 8 hours. In this reaction, the sodium lead alloy will react with the bromoethane, under the influence of pyridine, to form sodium bromide and tetraethyl lead. The reaction is relatively straightforward and is dependent on the sodium content of the alloy and the ability for the reagents to react properly. Adding water during the reaction will help expose fresh alloy that is not covered in oxidation and sodium bromide. When that is done, I come back and add water until no more reaction takes place, and at the same time take it off heat. I then leave it to stir overnight. I come back the next day, remove the condenser and attach a short path distillation apparatus. I start heating to boil off all of the remaining bromoethane. After that, I swap the receiving flask and start steam distilling over the tetraethyl lead. I simply boil over water continuously, which will carry over the tetraethyl lead. I occasionally add about 50 ml of water. When it looks like no more tetraethyl lead is coming over, and it's pretty much only water, I stop the distillation. Now I am left with a two layer system, with water on top and tetraethyl lead on the bottom, along with some impurities that have managed to come over. Now I move all of the contents to a separatory funnel and separate the layers. I then pour the tetraethyl lead back in and wash it once with some dilute sodium hydroxide. I then repeat the same process with dilute sulfuric acid. We can see a lot of the colored impurity was taken out by the sulfuric acid and moved into the water layer, which is now red. Since it worked so well, I repeat the dilute sulfuric acid wash two more times. When that is done, the tetraethyl lead is now only slightly yellow. To finish it up, I wash it once with some water. Now I take the tetraethyl lead and add some calcium chloride to remove any remaining water. I let it sit for a bit and then set up a flask with a funnel. In the funnel, I put a small filter paper and then filter all of the tetraethyl lead through. I then remove the funnel and replace it with a short path distillation apparatus. I insulate it with a bit of aluminum foil and pull a strong vacuum to distill over all of the tetraethyl lead. It comes over cleanly as a clear liquid, with a boiling point of 60 C at around 5 millibars of pressure. When all of it has distilled over, I am left with 19 grams of tetraethyl lead. I can't calculate the percent yield properly, since I don't know the exact contents of my alloy, but the yield for the final reaction is normally below 25%. Now to do a small characterization, besides knowing its boiling point, I can confirm if the compound contains lead by doing a flame test. Lead will burn white grey if held in a flame. So I set up a torch and then scoop out some of the liquid with a spatula and hold it in the flame. As we can see, it ignites easily and some white grey stuff is coming off, which is characteristic of tetraethyl lead. Since tetraethyl lead is the only compound that could have formed here that is a liquid with this boiling point, I can be sure that I have tetraethyl lead here. So that was it for this video, thanks for watching and as always a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya!